Hi there, I'm Peter Canego from Midship Cinema. This one's about a ship that needs no introduction. So without further ado, On Saturday, August 26, 1995, we awoke to a splendid view from Miami's Biscayne Bay Marriott. The Dodge Island lineup included the Belgian-built day cruise ship Tropicana and Carnival Cruise Line's popular celebration and imagination, as well as our home for the next week, NCL's classic Norway. Shortly thereafter, my friends and I were queuing up to board the ship, we were part of a large group of enthusiasts who would be celebrating the Norway's special heritage and history as French Line's SS France. Embarking on Norway deck, we headed forward on the port side to our cabin N110, which was the SS France's former first-class cabin M072, still decked out in its original 1961 French Line fixtures with NCL's pastel soft fittings it featured a double porthole. In addition to a bathroom with a full-size tub and sink, it had a separate loo with a toilet and sink, 36 years before the Disney magic. We joined friends for the boat drill, then headed up to the open deck for the sail away. Almost immediately, we were passing the then state-of-the-art imagination, which was only two months old at the time. Sadly, in 2022, she is still sitting at a Turkish scrapyard waiting to be cut up after being beached on September 14, 2020. And this is what our magnificent ship looked like as she sailed off. For a while, we enjoyed the slight breeze under the bridge wing on Port Olympic deck and its open promenade that encircled the superstructure. As the Norway approached the Biscayne Bay pilot station, she looked resplendent in the afternoon light. Despite unflattering additions to her superstructure over the years, her hull lines and proportions were those of a true ship of state. Twenty years before Carnival's Tropical introduced the line's whale tail funnel, the Francis stacks were the first to dispense with exhaust off to the sides of the ship via their elegant wing extensions. Alas, by the time this video was shot, Norway's funnels had been given pipe extensions to dispense her fumes through. Not far behind us was Royal Caribbean's Sovereign of the Seas. From Norway's aft pool deck, we had a great view of Miami Beach as the ship passed government cut and entered the Atlantic. Today, swanky condos now tower over this part of South Point Park. Carnival's 1987 built celebration was well ahead of us as the sovereign of the seas, then the world's third largest cruise ship, turned on a southerly course in sync with the Norway. And Celebrity Cruises Zenith joined our convoy, having departed a bit earlier from Fort Lauderdale en route to the Caribbean. Just before heading for dinner, I laid the cameras to rest for the day.
On our first sea day, I was up on deck to begin my systematic process of documenting the ship. Just after this shot of one of my least favorite spaces, Le Bistro Cafe, my camera broke down. Blame it on the Tivoli lighting, but it is nice to remember that at least at that point, dining there was free of charge. While I unfortunately couldn't document it, that day there was a busy program of regular shipboard events like port briefings, bingo, and wine tastings. At night, there was the captain's welcome, and on stage, the Will Rogers Follies. Our Steamship Historical Society group hosted lectures by the world-renowned Frank Brainerd, and even one by yours truly. On our second sea day, regular activities included shopping talks, a chocolate buffet, and team trivia. There were also additional presentations for the Steamship Historical Society group in the Fjord Conference Room. In St. Martin, I brought my camcorder along, hoping to find a camera shop that could repair it. But all that became unnecessary as it started working again on the tender. With a huge sigh of relief, I captured the magnificent Blue Lady as she sat backlit in the anchorage. At this time, years before the advent of the Queen Mary II, the 1,035-foot Long Norway was the longest passenger ship ever built and looked every inch of it. On our long ride to the tender landing, we passed Windjammer Barefoot Cruises' four-masted schooner Polynesia, which was built in 1938 as the Argus. Norway's 88-foot tenders were called Little Norway 1 and Little Norway 2, and were their own registered ships. When not secured atop her bow, these catamarans, which were inspired by World War II landing craft, were busy shuttling up to 450 guests to and from the ship. Once ashore in St. Martin, we took a cab to the Dutch side of the island and spent an afternoon lazing in the sands at Kupakoi Beach. On our return, as the little Norway navigated some bumpy swells, our beautifully lit mothership looked especially regal in the Caribbean twilight. The next morning found Norway in the outer anchorage of St. Thomas. As we tendered ashore, I was so happy to have my camcorder back in action to capture this striking beauty at her best angle. Even the handsome sovereign of the seas paled by comparison. Once ashore, we hired a ride to Megan's Beach, which is nice, but definitely not up to its claims as one of the top 10 beaches in the world. Before long, we were back aboard one of the little Norways, speeding past the Sovereign on our way back to the Great Blue Lady. A busy afternoon of documenting lay ahead. With most of our fellow guests ashore or up on deck melting in the late August heat, I started my documenting at the midship's Norway deck lobby. This wide open space led to my favorite room on the ship, the exquisite Windward Dining Room. Originally the France's first class Chambord Dining Room, designed by Madame d'Arbois Gaudin, it had a grand descent to showcase the arrival of first class passengers dressed to the nines. 
A spectacular anodized aluminum rotunda ceiling towered over the center of the room. NCL toned down some of the overly bright lighting and replaced the original angled chairs that were known to cause injury in rough seas, but otherwise left this hallowed space intact. They also added fiber optic lighting that mimicked twinkling stars. Another highlight was the series of stylish enameled aluminum wall panels by Jean Mandelroux called The Pleasures of Life. The one drawback of the Windward's metallic dome was that the room could get a bit noisy and some private conversations tended to echo throughout the space. I'll finish here with a pair of backlit glass fixtures that guarded the entrances to the galley. From there, we met up with the deck officer, who through the good graces of Captain Hans Meg, led us out to the forecastle, where I could get a shot of the Norway's face without the little Norway's impeding. We even headed out to the Whaleback, an SS France architectural feature that mimicked that of the Normandy and was later copied by the mighty Queen Mary II. We then headed down through the mooring area and walked all the way forward to the tip of the bow, nicknamed Le Nez de France, or the Nose, which was saved in the scrapping process and is now on display at the Le Havre passenger terminal. Somehow, despite my deep entrenched vertigo, I managed the climb up inside the funnel, or chimney, for a breathtaking view. Even my friend Kevin, who has no fear of heights, was shocked that I did it. As Sovereign of the Seas motored away behind us, I didn't push my luck and planted myself trembling knees and all just after the recently added metal uptakes. Meanwhile, Kevin and our officer friend, whose name I sadly cannot recall, took more daring shots from the wing. After one more camera pan, we somehow managed the climb back down to our cabin unscathed, save for some well-earned soot stains. I spent the rest of the afternoon up on deck capturing both chimneys and the upper deck areas from various angles, working my way aft from Star Deck, which was added during the ship's 1990 refit. From aft Star Deck, there was a nice view of the Sky Deck pool which was added in the France to Norway conversion, replacing a courtyard called Le Patio that was shared by a group of eight first-class cabins. The outer perimeter of Le Patio was kept intact and lined with portholes that peered into the pool. Funny that from the perspective of midship sun deck, the forward funnel didn't look as tall as it did from atop the structure itself. Those unique funnels were so beautifully sculpted and proportioned, they looked gorgeous from every angle. He 
because the Francis funnel bases sloped downwards, NCL built the 1990 superstructure additions around them. This did nothing for the ship's good looks, but the extra accommodations can be credited with adding another decade to the Norway's life. I wrapped up the day's deck shots with a view over the aft pool area, just as Norway began to steam away from St. Thomas. The windward was decked out for Viking night, where we were given horned Viking caps and shots of aquavit to raise in a toast helmed by Captain Mig. In those halcyon days, NCL and the Norway's officers gave the Steamship Historical Group such generous access, including our own bridge tour, thanks to the great planning and organization of Long Island Chapter President Tom Cassidy. SS Norway superfan and expert Jeff Macklin conducted the bridge visit. This is a charring table on this ship particularly. Due to her size and her lack of maneuverability, they have... I lingered for a few minutes after the tour for some uncluttered footage and then headed down to continue documenting the public spaces on our last full sea day. The North Cape Lounge on aft pool deck was empty and a good place to start. This cabaret show lounge spanned the full width of the ship, originally the Francis Tourist Class Salon Saint-Tropez and featuring what was billed as the longest bar afloat on its aft port side. It was completely revamped by decorator Angelo Dongia in the initial Norway conversion. Well, I had to wrap up the public spaces here for a very good reason. Once again, our group was given unfettered access, this time to the engine room. Our tour began in the control room, where we were given a brief overview of the machinery before heading into the one place that was actually hotter than the Caribbean in the summer. We began at the very bottom of the ship in Shaft Alley and were next shown the main electrical panel with its still original transformers. Of course, this power plant, which once propelled quadruple screws at a maximum 33 knot speed for transatlantic crossings, had been downgraded to running twin screws at a far more economical 18 knots for full-time cruising. And how sweet it was to see the main control panel with its massive Chantier de l'Atlantique builder's plate taking center stage. Our visit concluded with a fleeting glance at the ship's towering 35-foot boilers. Back in our beautifully air-conditioned cabin, we watched the sunset over glass-like seas. Late that evening, I picked up the cameras again to document the leeward dining room, 
the former tourist class Versailles restaurant. In the France to Norway refit, the NCL team added a spiral staircase to connect the upper and lower levels and installed a metal chandelier in the center of the dome. The overall ambience of this room was pleasant enough, although the lower level felt a bit cavernous. Certainly it was a far less impressive space than the windward. Norway's elegant sheer, or the midship's downward curvature, made her long alleyways seem even longer. I finished off that late evening of filming by capturing the forward stairs and all of its vestibules. This spacious one on Norway deck was the former tourist class entrance foyer. The next morning, we passed Sovereign of the Seas shortly before dropping anchor at NCL's private Bahamian out island, Great Stirrup Key. I went ashore with the sole purpose of getting more exterior footage of the ship and ran into a close friend and one of my favorite artists, the late Don Stoltenberg, who was adding the Norway to his pastel sketchbook. These would be my final tender shots of Norway in active service. The next time I would capture her from this perspective was shortly after she beached at Alang as the Blue Lady in 2006. I prefer to remember her like this. Back on board, my documenting began in the concierge lounge the former first-class children's playroom, which still had original panels by Noel. Next up was by far my least favorite space, the Monte Carlo Casino on pool deck, which was originally the tourist-class smoking room or Rive Gauche Lounge. Its flashy Tivoli lighting and faux 80s deco black lacquered surfaces spread like a cancer in this part of the ship as the casino was expanded in subsequent years. And now the favorite retreat of most Norway fans, the elegant Club International on aft international deck. I much preferred its look as the France's first class smoking room when instead of clamshell Miami Deco fixtures and colors, it boasted striking tapestries and windows that overlooked the stern. But at least those glorious spindly chandeliers were left intact, and it was a lovely setting for Norway's high tea. And then on Midship's International Deck, there was the Checkers Cabaret. Angelo Donghia transformed France's first class smoking room into a gaudy but fun red and gold lounge with a checkerboard dance floor and whimsical Tivoli lit palm trees. At least it had personality, unlike the generic sports bar that would soon replace it. France's wide-open first-class promenades were transformed into boulevards with shops and an ice cream parlor that linked the public spaces on International Deck. On the port side, there was Fifth Avenue, and on the starboard, Champs-Élysées, in a nod to the ship's French heritage. The 
The Norway Saga Theatre was originally the France's Salle de Spectacle, whose upper level was first class and lower level tourist. The elegant brushed aluminum paneled cinema and concert hall was transformed by NCL into a state-of-the-art theater and became the setting for the very first huge production shows at sea. It also had gorgeous stained glass fixtures over the entryways. Tucked away on Forward Port International Deck, the former tourist class beauty salon became the Smoky Windjammer Bar, a favorite hideaway for Norway regulars. The first-class card room and library were pretty much left intact. Located on Norway's Port International Deck, the card room had wonderful ceiling fixtures, and the rotunda-shaped Ibsen Library was designed by Jean Lelou, whose work with French Line went all the way back to the Normandy of 1935. Unfortunately, NCL would soon transform this elegant space into a shop, although most of the original parts were kept intact. Many of the Norway's alleyways and stair tower vestibules sported wonderful carved aluminum panels depicting various French themes. While some were moved around, they stayed with the ship until mysteriously vanishing before she arrived at a lang for scrapping in 2006. As Norway began her short trek back to Miami, I stepped out on deck to capture a few shots of and from her fantail, then headed back inside to finish off a few more final spaces. Added in 1990, the Roman spa at the bottom of the ship replaced the first-class indoor pool. And speaking of pools, a club called Dazzles on aft Viking deck replaced the France's indoor-outdoor pool. With a backlit glass dance floor over the original pool basin, it featured portholes that peered into the large open-air pool that was added in the initial France to Norway conversion. After this, it was time to pack up the cameras and prepare for our departure the following day. I want to thank Tom Cassidy and the Long Island chapter of the Steamship Historical Society of America for putting this trip together. Not surprisingly, of course, we did hang around to watch Norway depart on her next cruise. This would be the last footage I would take of her in this livery, which would change the following year. Now, I'll let the Norway have the final word. Thanks again for watching, and if you haven't already, please remember to hit subscribe and like. That is, of course, if you liked. <laughs>